We have been told for years, even decades now, that U.S. government-approved laboratories across America are no longer abusing or torturing animals in experiments. We have been lied to. It's still happening. The U.S. government is still behind it, and there are still brokers, people out there who find these animals at shelters and turn them over for experiments that often lead to their death. There's good news here, actually, because there are people out there, organizations, that are trying to turn this around in the halls of Congress. And also they're taking their own time and their own money to try and make sure that these animals find loving homes. There's one type of animal that is near and dear to my heart, and that's what we will talk about here today. You'll hear more about the Beagle Freedom Project from the woman who has spent so many years and so much of her time making sure that these animals, these loving creatures, find loving homes and are no longer part of these rancid experiments. That's a special edition right here, right now, on The Man in the Arena. Theodore Roosevelt once said, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena. I believe there's a hero in all of us that keeps us honest, gives us strength, makes us noble. So that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Seize the day whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause. And I'm gonna stay right here and fight for this lost cause. You've got to get mad. I mean plum mad dog man. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Who at best, if he wins, knows the thrills of high achievement. And if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. I'm gonna show you how great I am. There is one crate, and it's just sitting there with a dog inside of it, terrified to come out, and her name was Echo. There you go, honey. There you go. You're okay, honey. Echo spent six years in a laboratory. Echo is just kind of out of it. All the others are running around except for Echo. Oh my God, thank God. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> They're here. 25 dogs were rescued from a laboratory in China. Thousands of these labs even exist right here in America. Beagle Freedom Project rescues animals used in testing. They've never been outdoors, never been on grass, have never felt the kind touch of a human. There was some product that they were putting in Echo's eyes to test it, and she went blind. I heard Beagle Freedom Project needed fosters. I went to help, and Echo fell asleep in my arms. I knew it was going to take a lot of time to help rehabilitate her. Gigi is my dog. She's feisty and very protective. Gigi started to lunge towards Echo and then stopped dead in her tracks and recognized that Echo was not your normal dog. I took her out to try and walk her. I think Echo was confused. I don't think she'd ever been walked before. As soon as Echo's paw hit the grass, she would steer the opposite direction. I wrapped a towel around her and when a dog falls asleep on you, you know that you're doing something right. Is that a tail that's wagging? It's a wagging tail. The first time I saw her tail wag was about two days in, and then every time she heard my voice, the tail would wag. Hey, Echo! Hi once again, everybody. I'm Ed Berliner. Welcome into this special edition of The Man in the Arena. Echo's story is a great place to start, because what many people don't know is beagles are the dogs that laboratories in America and around the world most often look to to test on, experiment on. And those experiments, those tests, they often leave the dogs blind, debilitated, hurt, injured, with a huge distrust of man. And many times they find themselves with no home, no hope, and they wind up being killed. However, there's good news. Careful because the waterworks may open up today because those of you who know me know how close I am to animals and what they mean to me. And instead of politics and all the other anger that goes on in the world today, let's look at something really positive. The Beagle Freedom Project in California has spent years 
time, hours, thousands of dollars, saving these animals around the world. Echo came from China. They go to Spain. They go everywhere to find these beagles and to save them. And we're going to talk about more about what happens in America and also what they do to help save these animals and to bring some real awareness to people across America that this still happens, even when we were told it no longer does. It is a pleasure to finally welcome into the show, and we've been trying to put this show together for a while, and I am so thrilled to welcome in the founder of the project. It is a pleasure to have Shannon Keith on the show today from Southern California. Shannon, thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for having us. We appreciate it. it. it it's, it's a pleasure to be here. So let's, let's start out. Let's do some positives here at the beginning, but, but let's get started with the project itself. itself. The Beagle Freedom Project. It's, it's not something that most people would imagine. You just think about one night and wake up and go, oh, I'm going to do something for beagles. How did this all get started? Uh, it started, uh, I'm an animal rights attorney, and um, I went into the law specifically to help animals because, as some people don't know, um, animals are still considered chattel in the law, which means that they're considered pieces of property. And so um, they're not worth much more than like your table or a lamp or something like that. When I found out that that was the case, I decided that I was going to make my life's mission to change that and go into law. While I was practicing animal rights law, um, I started becoming aware of all of these atrocities with animals and um, getting a little bit frustrated with the legal system because judges are loath to take any issue that's new, um, to take any chances. Animal rights law is an emerging law still. And it was difficult to make real change in the courtroom. I could make change on a case-by-case -case basis, but in the bigger picture, it was a lot harder. So I started a nonprofit organization called ARMY, Animal Rescue Media and Education, in 2004 in order to educate the public about what happens to animals, make documentary films, um, save lives locally. And in 2010, I was contacted by somebody who let me know that there were some dogs in a laboratory in Northern California who were about to be killed, some beagles. Um, they had been experimented on, and it was right before the holidays, right before Christmas. And the, this specific lab did not want to pay extra to have employees there to take care of the dogs. So rather than do that, they just decided they would kill them, then restart the test over once the new year began. And uh, there was luckily a very compassionate woman who worked there who did her best to try to get them out. And the company agreed that whoever she could find homes for, they would survive. And we were contacted to help. And so on December 23rd, 2010, we did our first rescue of our first two beagles, Freedom and Bigsby. And um, the experience changed my life. And Beagle Freedom Project was born. Is it not fair to say that what you're trying to do in a humanitarian sense is not met with universal acceptance by a number of people? You just mentioned the legal community itself. But I can only imagine what you get and what you find from the corporate world. And they would love nothing better, nothing better than to shut Shannon Keith down and up and not have you say a word because as you start to look at the companies that are involved here, we were told years ago, Shannon, these companies were no longer testing on animals, yet they still are to this day. Uh, they, we are public enemy number one to all of these companies, to the biomed industry. Um, about two years into Beagle Freedom Project is when um, the biomed industry started going public about their hatred towards us because we started changing laws. Uh, the goal was never to just simply save animals from laboratories and find them homes. Of course, that's amazing, and we continue to do that, and hopefully we'll continue to do that until this ends. Um, but the goal is also to change it, not just put a Band-Aid on the situation, but to change these laws, educate the public. And when we started doing that is when these labs started coming out against us, um, these huge trade industry groups um, that have whole conferences lit literally devoted to Beagle Freedom Project and how to combat really? our work. 
really that's all they do is just focus on you what do they do with these conferences and what do they what do they conscionably say about you when you're trying to save animals and i guess their whole argument to this would be oh we have to do this 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 is necessary when in essence so many of these tests have been shown that they can be accomplished without live animal testing Exactly. Yeah. In fact, the NIH, the National Institute of Health, came out years ago, I would I probably back in 2014, with a press release saying that they knew that animal testing did not produce the types of results that we actually need to help humankind, and that it was more expensive and detrimental, actually, to human health. And it was encouraging all these companies who test on animals to, to really practice reducing, refining their research, and stopping animal tests. Um, the, we have the biology, we have the technology now, we have everything that we need to do so, it's just that these companies don't want to spend the money to do it. That's the scary part. And so many drugs that are released on the market that are tested on animals end up really harming human, human beings and sometimes killing them. Let's go ahead and call them out. I have no problem with that whatsoever. Let's discuss those companies that are basically, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say this. I like to use the phrase bovine excrement uh, in light of something else that comes up a little more foul languaged. But those who use that to try and shine the American public that what they're doing is not that bad and, and they need to do it and, and they're lying. Give us a couple of examples, would you please? Sure. Um, I think that most people would be surprised that many of their common household products test on animal test on animals, and it's not even required by law for them to test on animals. So I'd like to kind of start with those things. Um, so, huge company Procter and Gamble. Procter and Gamble makes almost every big name brand that you see in the market. You know, like um, there's Colgate, there's Palmolive, like. All of these brands that you typically see, all you have to do is look up Procter & Gamble or Colgate Palmolive or Johnson & Johnson or SC Johnson Wax. You'll see all the name brands under those companies, and you will recognize almost all of them. These companies do not have to test on animals, period. It is not required by law. The only exception for a product is like an insecticide or something like that, unfortunately, where they're still required by the FDA to do some sort of animal testing. Um, but when we're talking about laundry detergent, um, you know, any kind of household cleaners, makeup, we're, you know, Revlon tests on animals. Um, luckily, CoverGirl just went cruelty free, but they had been testing on animals for years. Um, and a lot of these companies, what they do is, let's say you look up a company like Revlon, like does Revlon test on animals? They will, it, it'll be a huge paragraph about how they do not test on animals and how they've come up with all of these alternatives, which is great. They're saying they're coming up with alternatives even though they don't really have to um, because it, they don't have to test on animals. But in very small print, they will say that, well, sometimes testing is required uh, to adhere to regulations in other countries, which means that they still support and conduct animal testing. And that's how they trick the public. They're lying, aren't they? Flat out. Yep. They're lying. Um, it is atrocious. And, you know, sometimes we get attacked for that saying, hey, these companies don't test. Um, why are you saying that they test? We have an app. It's a free app I encourage everyone to use. And, um, all you do is you scan a product, tells you instantly if that product is cruelty free or not, meaning whether or not it was tested on animals. And some people come back and say, hey, this product came back as not cruelty free, but, but I looked them up and they don't test on animals. And I spoke to somebody and they said they don't test on animals either. Um, they are consistently lying to the public. It is a deceptive practice. It's a deceptive field. And I call it the industry's dirty little secret that they just want to deceive the public. We, we, we lost a piece of you there on audio. Did you say that there is an app available for this that people can use or some kind of a scan? Yeah, we created an app called Cruelty Cutter. 
It's a free app to use and it makes it very easy to shop cruelty free. Um, so you download it and you scan the barcode on any product and it will instantly tell you if that product is cruelty free or not, meaning whether or not that product tests on animals or not. And it's wonderful because you get an instant result and then you can also share your results. You can share them via Twitter, email, Instagram, and it also tags the company. So let's say you scan a product, you scan um, uh, Colgate, tells you, you know, this product tests on animals. You can click the boycott button to boycott that company, and then you can share the results, which tags that company that set instantly says, I didn't buy your product because you test on animals. And so that's another way that we're making these companies very aware that they're losing money because they continue to test on animals when they don't have to. Shannon, do they do this, continue to use the animals when they don't have to simply because it's cheap? There's a few reasons why, and that's definitely one of them. It's cheaper to continue the status quo than to change things. In the long run, it's going to be a lot cheaper not to, not to test on animals. They don't have to keep live animals and hire people to care for them and that type of thing. Um, but they don't want to make a change now because it's going to be too expensive for them. It's going to kind of rattle the cage of what they know, and they don't like to change things. Um, but the other reason, and this is coming from, straight from the mouths of people who have done testing and from very prominent scientists and doctors, have said that the reason that it continues, especially in the pharmaceutical realm, is because it creates data. So, for example, at UCLA, they've been doing methamphetamine tests on cats for decades. The same tests for wow. decades. And... They do it because it creates data that they can then present and get huge grants for. And they, you know, then they're guaranteed their tenure, they get money for the school, um, and that type of a thing. And then we're talking about a drug that is also illicit, <laughs> isn't necessary to save a life. We last know time, what it last does. Last time I checked, there's nobody sitting there saying that methamphetamine is going to save my life somewhere unless I missed something somewhere along the epidemiology way of, of, of looking at viruses and diseases and such. I think I might have missed that somewhere. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So it's very frustrating. You know, they just perform these same tests over and over again. And that's actually, that was one of my, um, my first experiences um, kind of sort of face to face with animals in laboratories. Um, this was back in the late 90s. Um, I went into the UCLA um, building where, where they have all these, they have the primates, and they have the dogs, and they have the cats there. And I just pretended that I was a student and just kind of hit buttons on the elevator. And I, I knew the floor that the cats were on. And when I got off on the elevator, um, there was a specific vivisector who I was looking for. I wanted to go to his office and just talk to him. And when I got to his office, there was a little note that said, um, you know, surgery in progress down the hall. And so I proceeded down the hall, which was just the eeriest place. And... Um, there was another door at the end of the hall that said surgery in progress and I opened the door and everybody freaked out and I could hear the cats just screaming in pain as they were undergoing some sort of surgery while they were conscious and not given pain medication. Um, and that was sort of my first experience kind of seeing vivisection for myself. and it really hit home and that is why I made it my passion to change this. I want to warn people that we're going to show some pictures here right now. Not a, not a lot, but we're going to show a few pictures. And if you are if you don't want to see them, you can turn away, but I would heartily suggest and recommend that you do not because as a as a journalist, I'm one of those people who always says know your subject, know what's happening. These are not going to be gruesome, but these are going to be some examples of what happens in the laboratories. And for those of you listening to us on our audio podcasts, uh, I would recommend that you go to YouTube and find this show on the video side so you can see them. But give us an idea, if you will, uh, of some of the things, not just what we're seeing, 
but but also what people don't understand, because I, I will tell you a lot of the messages that we're getting right now on the live show on Facebook is people saying, I had no idea. I, I didn't realize this. I, I didn't realize that this was still happening in America. So let's begin with the fact that the animals are at times, and as you can see in this picture, this animal has had its hair shaved, and there are what almost seem to be a, a number of, of holes that have been punctured into the animal here. So we're seeing in invasive procedures in many in many instances here, are we not? Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, we have rescued dogs that look like that. Actually, we've rescued a few dogs that have had devices implanted into their heads. And we know when we get them, their head is still shaved with holes in their heads. Um, they have, they're intubated constantly, they, meaning they've got tubes shoved down their throats to sh just pour poison down their throats. So even when you're talking about household products or cosmetics, they're going to do that to like you know, determine some sort of toxicity level for a product, even though they don't have to. Um, what they do to them is, is horrific. And even if it's not invasive, these dogs are born to a breeder and so they're born into animal testing they're ripped from their mothers when they're four weeks wow. old and then they're sold to a laboratory and this is how they live look at this picture this is how they live these little tiny puppies grow up in a cage um, with nothing most of these facilities are in basements so nobody knows they exist so you can't hear the animals you can't see them and they can't communicate with one another because many of these facilities debark them. So they, they, they can't even communicate with each other. They still remove the vocal cords. They remove the vocal cords, right. So you, they, can't, they can see one another, but they can't even communicate with one another. And not only that, but in order to further remove any sort of emotion that anybody in the laboratory would have towards those dogs, they tattoo their ears with a federal identification number, and that's all they're known by. They do not have a name. They simply have a federal ID number, and that's who they are. And like in this, you know, experiment, I mean, this looks like, you know, some type of inhalation experiment, smoking or something like that. Um, a lot of these people who, who work there, uh, who I've spoken to, they have dogs at home who they love they say, who are part of their families, they see dogs in laboratories as completely different, as pieces of property. When people finally get a chance to look at this, and I want to go back and, and talk about some of the things that, that you just mentioned, these are the people whom I call the death dealers of what we're involved in here. And I don't think people are again aware, first of all, the government gives this its approval taxpayer money goes to this the money that we spend our money goes to this and shannon it's the class a and the class b dealers that get involved here explain to us the difference here because boy i'll tell you i didn't know this until i researched it yeah um yeah there's there's a difference between class a and class b dealers and most people don't even know that terminology because it's not your your everyday terminology that you would know um they're both legal and they're both paid by, um, well, they're both, you have to get certification under the USDA to be a class A dealer or a class B dealer. Class A dealers are the ones, uh, like the huge facilities who, uh, that breed dogs for testing, um, like let's say Marshall Bioresources. Mar Marshall Bioresources is one of the largest, if not the largest animal breeding facility in the United States testing and for other purposes. Um, so they would be considered a class A dealer. They have, you know, rows and rows of sheds and of just animals being tortured, all kinds of animals in there. Uh, they're breeding, they're testing, and they're selling. Um, then there's what's called the class B dealers. And these are people who are still licensed by the USDA, but they can go into somebody's backyard, steal a dog, and then sell that dog to a laboratory and make a ton of money off that animal. And it's Wait, hold, hold it. Hold it, hold it right there. Stop, because let's... <laughs> I have to take a couple of seconds on that. The government is approving certain dealers. 
They are paying them money. It is our taxpayer dollars that are going to it. People who will go into the backyard of a home where a dog is in a, a fenced-in area, if you will, steal the animal, take the animal then, sell it to a laboratory, and it's all legal. Did I miss something? Um, yeah, so obviously the, gover the government doesn't want to know how those animals were acquired because, of course, it's technically illegal, right, obviously, to go and trespass and steal. Um, so these Class B dealers lie on their paperwork, or and they're not checked on. I mean, there's no government regula regulations for this. So Class B dealers are making a lot of money because they get these animals for free instead of purchasing them and then selling them to laboratories. And I have actually a personal experience with that um, where, I mean, this was years and years ago. Um, I rescued a dog who had puppies from, a, uh, from the shelter and um, adopted one of the puppies to some, somebody who lived across the street from me. Long story short, that puppy was stolen uh, from the yard and people saw it happened, witnessed it, and they had four digits of the license plate. Detectives, police did nothing. So I rallied the troops and we kind of harassed this detective until he actually did something about it. Lo and behold, he finds the puppy, Leo, two days later at this person's home who is a class B dealer. His home is full of dogs who he's selling to animal research. I could not believe it. Thank God we got Leo back, but you know that they failed to prosecute this person. And that's what's so frustrating about the legal system. Did they fail to prosecute or they just couldn't give a damn? Both. Does this come right back up to what you said at the beginning of the show? These animals are chattel, they're property. And it's, whether it's a judge, whether it's a, a cop, whether it's anybody in an official status, they look at it and go, Come on, it's it's just a dog. What's the big deal? I, isn't that fair to say that that's a lot of times how they look at it, the the, the emotionless manner with which they, they look at this? And it's breaking the law, who cares? Completely. Even that detective said to me, wow, um, you know, when you got involved, I mean, this is worse than an amber alert. He's like, I'm just going to get this done so that I can get you guys off, off my back. Um that's the way that he saw it is like just get it over with so they stop calling me now the usda has something called the animal welfare act which was supposed to care for a lot of this actually and if you read the animal welfare act minimal standards for the treatment of animals in labs but mm -hmm. i did not know this until again i, I did my research on this it does not prohibit any experiment, no matter how painful, trivial, or duplicative. It allows animals to be burned, shocked, poisoned, paralyzed, starved, cut into, brain damaged, decapitated, and killed. Shannon, what the hell's going on here? These are government regulations here. These are, this is, and, and it, it has nothing to do with current administrations. Let's stop. This is... This is the government of the United States. This is the USDA saying it's okay to do this. And I know that you've you've been fighting this for a while. What's happened here? What, what is is this is there anything we can do? Is there any is there any recourse here? Does anybody give a damn? It's very frustrating. The Animal Welfare Act, this ridiculous piece of legislation has been in effect for, for um, it doesn't protect certain animals you just showed on the screen there it allows for basic torture of animals and they will say that that's okay because that could be part of a testing protocol so part of a testing protocol can be you know you've got to cut open this animal alive because you've got to study a certain, how a certain organ or bodily function reacts when you do that and most of these facilities who do the testing that do the testing don't want to spend the money on pain medication when they're allowed to do that for that protocol. Other times they're not allowed to give them pain medication for a certain test because they're studying the pain level. And so the Animal Welfare Act is, is 
it's useless. Basically, it's been useless for years and years. And that's why we have to come up with our own legislation to protect animals in different areas. And that's one of the reasons Beagle Freedom Project exists. You know, we target certain areas that are just ridiculous and pathetic, educate the public about it, and try to bring that forth with legislation, make a change that way. And because the Animal Welfare Act is, you know, people think, oh, well, we have government regulations. We have the Animal Welfare Act. But they don't really it's realize joke. it's actually completely useless. It, it, it's a joke. and I But I do want to point out that you are trying to do something. Because sitting in the halls of Congress right now, sponsored by Democratic Representative Kathleen Rice out of New York, which was introduced back in May of 2019, is H.R. 2850, the Humane Retirement Act, requiring animal care committees at entities that receive federal funds for biomedical or behavioral research to make reasonable efforts to find parties to adopt dogs and cats that have been retired from research. Prior to euthanizing, the Animal Care Committee must assess the temperament of the dog or cat to determine whether it is suitable for adoption, and if so, make reasonable efforts to offer the dog or cat to an adopting party. Now, as you and I started the show, I mentioned that this is, like so many other things, stuck in committee these days, and I know that you've been a, a You've been starting this. You you got this started in 2019. Has there been any update? Do we do we know where this? I know that. Look, there's people are going to say we got a lot more things in this country right now to worry about. Well, this has been sitting and festering now for for decades. So it is. Are the are the lawmakers interested? Let's put it that way. Do the lawmakers look at this and say, yeah, let's get this done, or do they just shovel it off to the side? Uh, so. The Humane Retirement Act is actually our signature le legislation. It's it's the Beagle Freedom Bill that we started back in 2015. Um, and Representative Rice loved it and took it and made it federal, which is amazing. And we have every reason to believe that this is going to pass once the pandemic is over. Um, we have now passed that signature legislation in 11 states, which is incredible. And so now we're just hoping that it passes federally um, so we don't have to go state by state anymore. Now, this is a first step. What people need to know is it's a first step in really understanding what happens to animals. Because as you were saying, you know, most people don't know this still goes on. Um, and also, most people don't know that they're killed. That's the status quo, that they're not given up for adoption when the testing is over. And that's not to say that we condone the testing, we don't. But animal testing isn't gonna stop overnight. It's a very slow process that I know too well. And that's why we're working on it incrementally so it actually works and it sticks. But right now, what we can do is when they are still healthy enough to be released, that they get to be released and they get to have a second chance at life. And they don't just get killed because there's no legislation to protect them. So. There were some facilities or there are some facilities that have sort of in-house adoption programs, but that's only if there are enough people available to adopt them. Also, these facilities are incredibly secretive. They don't want anyone to know mm. that they're testing on dogs and cats, the types of animals who we share our homes with, who are part of our families, as we all know. And so that's another reason that they hate Beagle Freedom Project is because we make that public and they hate this legislation. And you would think it's common sense legislation, you know, just, okay, we're not interfering with your testing. When you are done with them, let them go. According to you, they have done a service to animals or a service to human beings and they should have a chance to live. But we are definitely fraught with fighting uh, tooth and nail. I mean, in California here, it took two years to pass that legislation. And what's very interesting, and what I'd like people to know as well, is that um, our opposition, which is universities, schools like Stanford, UC Davis, they were opposing our bill um, the first year. And their reasoning was that, well, these animals aren't adoptable. They're born and bred to be used as test subjects, and they cannot live in a home environment. And, of course, my response was, okay, at that time, we've got, you know, hundreds and hundreds of animals who do live in homes. We've got a thousand families. <laughs> so that's a complete lie. 
So and, what happened was, and you bring them home uh-huh. like this. You you do, you do vet these dogs. You bring them home, and you give them a chance to get back on grass, or at least get on grass for the first time. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, they have never been outside. Um, that's actually at my house where Beagle Freedom Project first started, <laughs> and um, yeah, it's oh yeah, that brings back a lot of memories. Um, look, you can just see in their eyes that they have never seen the outdoors ever. Um, that's Sia, who's an amazing artist, um, and um, they've just never been outside. They've never smelled the outdoors. They've never seen the sunshine. They've never put their paw on anything other than a metal grate. Uh, all their paws are inflamed and infected. Their teeth are in horrible condition. Here they are um, being released for the first time and you can see how tentative they are. Some are more excited than others. Some are more scared. You know, They all have their different personalities and ways of coping with freedom just like we do. Um, but it's all of course, the most amazing moment when you see them finally come out of the crate and realize, oh, this is what life is supposed to be. I mean, especially <laughs> for a beagle, the scent hound, you know. So, it's it's incredible. Here's actually video that we're watching right now. I guess of four of the boys. Uh, this is coming off the same rescue, correct? Yes. Yeah. They um, and as you can see, they're a little bit older. They've been in a laboratory for many, many years, and um, it's hard for them to adjust, but they've all adjusted. We have a 100% success rate, (laughs) so cute, of these animals just adjusting to home life, to being the best companions ever. Is that the thing that people need to realize, that these are not your ordinary shelter dogs? They They have lived in kennels. They have been tested on. They have been experimented on. They have never, many of them have never seen the sun before. They've never had a treat handed them by somebody. They've never had a, look at that. They've never had somebody hold them, pet them. And that's what human dignity and and human kindness is supposed to be about. I, I don't think people understand that, do they? You really have to explain this to people many times, don't you? Definitely. They don't get it. Um, And why should they? They haven't been told this. You know, this is a a huge huge industry secret. Um, But yeah, I mean, these dogs don't even understand voice intonations, the difference between right and wrong. You know, we're so used to saying like, oh, that's great. Good. Good girl. You know, that talking like that. um, They don't know what that means. They've never even been spoken to. I want to now, shift a little bit, and I want to tell some positive stories because we want to make sure that people see that we are doing this show, and I have wanted to do this show for a long time to raise awareness. We're getting a tremendous amount of response here on Facebook Live. I know that when it hits YouTube and on the, the audio podcasts, a lot of people are going to listen to this. But there's always been a question, and I've had people ask me this because when we talk about beagles, people will say, why beagles? You went to Spain not long ago, and the Beagle Freedom Project helped to rescue some dogs in Spain, showing once again that you folks are global. And here was a great example and a great understanding of why it's beagles. From the moment they're born, they're literally in, in a cage, never see the light of day. The only contact they have is with human beings that literally pick them up to test on them and then put them back. Beagles are often tested on because they are gentle dogs. It's their characteristics which is their downfall because they're so nice, which is why they're used for this type of experiment. We also know that they were used for human drug research. Um, A lot of them have injuries, they've got scars. Now the biggest hurdle is getting these dogs into foster homes. So we have to do a lot of medical on them before they can actually go to a permanent home. 14 dogs still need foster homes. The Beagle Freedom Project picks up all expenses and it cost over $50,000 to bring the dogs to Los Angeles. And it's going to cost more um, to just care for these dogs. We just found out most of them need teeth extracted. They need blood work done. Uh, they need a lot of help. The dream is to have all these dogs in loving families, living like a normal pet. 
th- there's a key in there, and that's and I can tell you as being a Beagle owner myself, gee, what a shock. Ed's talking about the Beagle Freedom Project, and he's a Beagle owner himself. And yes, there is a surprise near the end of the show. That's fine. But they are docile. They are friendly. They are so trusting of humans that they will do anything for a human being. When you rescue these dogs and you you bring them into your home and you work with them, how do you overcome the fact that from that very beginning, I can imagine that some of them want absolutely nothing to do with a human being? Um, And that's what uh, got to me the most on on our very first rescue. Uh, You know, you think about how this works and what an animal or a dog, a beagle, what he or she would love the second that he gets out of a laboratory, right? And um, before we released our first two dogs, I was fantasizing the whole time about their release and how much they would love it. And when we would open the cage door, they would just run out and be so excited to be free and be dogs and be beagles and sniff everything and run around, chase sense. Um, but the opposite was true at first. When we opened the cage doors, they wouldn't come out of their crates. They were scared to death of what this world was. Um, imagine just being born as an adult um, into the world where you just have no idea what's going on. It took the first beagle at least 20 minutes to exit his crate. It, the second one wouldn't until he came over to him and touched his nose and told him it was okay. And then he took his first steps. What I always say is that we have so much to learn from these animals, so much to learn from these dogs because they're so forgiving. And in fact, that's a word that one of these animal testers used with me. He said, well, we use beagles because they're forgiving. They're forgiving. Do we not have to remember, too, that while this is an American problem that we're talking about here, this is a global problem. You've been to Spain. You've rescued dogs there. And I have had guests on my show over the years dealing with the Yulon Festival um, in Asia, uh, the dog meat festivals that are held there, the brutal, the brutal treatment of animals there and the way that they are skinned alive and, and, and basically flayed in front of people for food. And that happens to these animals quite often. How do you fight that? Because aren't you, in many ways, Shannon, aren't we fighting culture? We're finding the experimentation here in many of these areas that's just brutally evil. But the culture itself, you've got to fight to save these animals. That's exactly right. And it makes it very difficult because we get attacked a lot for that. We also rescue dogs from the dog meat trade um, in China and in South Korea. Hmm. And in fact, a couple of the rescues that we did were older beagles who had been in a testing lab their entire lives then were on their way to be killed for food when our partners there rescued them off the trucks. Um, So (laughs) they had the worst of the worst. And, um, you know, we want to be able to rescue them and change things, but obviously changing, like you said, a culture is not so easy. Um, But I think that we're making great strides. The more we step in and rescue and make people aware the more other countries are kind of paying attention. And especially now with this pandemic, I really hope that people Mm. understand that it is the torture of animals that is now causing the death of humans. I wanted to, there's there's one thing that I did want to discuss. I don't think we got to it, but I wanted to make sure I know we talked about some of the positives here. But there's another phraseology in here that people have not really got come to grips with. It is something called pound seizures. Which, which I don't think people are, are well aware of. I'm going to have you comment on it. Here's a report talking about exactly what pound seizures are. Sadly, what pound seizure means is that Class B dealers 
licensed by the USDA can go to any shelter, take those animals, many of whom were somebody's beloved animal who lived at home with them, sell them to a laboratory and have them tested and tortured on. Our partners in Mexico were able to rescue the victims of pound seizure. One of them was hit by a car so many times to break his bones. One of them, her jaw was punched and punched and punched until it broke. On the other one, her tail was broken. And on two of the dogs, they actually tested them for cosmetics. These practices have to end. We can't wait to be able to rescue these amazing dogs, rabbits, and mice and bring them to our new rock. Shannon, what can we do with regard to the shelters themselves? Because I know that shelters are always trying to make the right decisions. They are always trying to make sure that the animals, and we hear this a lot from shelter officials, to make sure that our dogs, our animals, our cats, whatever, go to the right homes and they vet them. Yet, however, it would seem that there are unscrupulous uh, individuals out there who just don't give a damn, who take them from the shelters and will sell them to make a buck. How can we... How can we combat that? What can we do? So that's something that we're working on with um, legislation. Um, definitely wanted to uh, bring it forward this year, but that wasn't possible. Um, so we will be going after those states where pound seizure is still legal and changing that law. So pound seizure is still legal in many, many states and in many jurisdictions. And uh, people don't realize it. People don't see it. Um, it's a secret practice and the shelters do know about it. But as you said, there are so many people who work in shelters who really care about the animals, want to see them go to the right home. But if it's the law that class B dealers can come in and get these dogs and cats and other animals, there's nothing that they can, can do about it. They can't stop it. And then on the other hand, there are a lot of shelters who that work directly with laboratories and know what they're doing. And unfortunately, that's an issue too. But I would say for the most part, most of them don't really understand it and can't really do anything about it. And so what Beagle Freedom Project is going to do starting next year is introduce legislation to ban pound seizure. Um, I think what you know people really need to know is that, you know, you have a dog, you have a dog who you love, he's part of your family, you know, he he's your child. And something horrific happens. He gets out. He escapes. The gardener leaves the door open, whatever. He's gone. He gets picked up by the shelter. For some reason, you don't see him. The stray hold is up, the five-day stray hold, the four-day stray hold. And guess what? Somebody comes in and buys your dog and sells him to animal testing. And he's tortured the rest of his life. Are we... Last couple of words you said there caught me, um, which are terrible. Is this one of those things where we need to tell people that if you're going to have a dog, a cat, whatever, if you don't chip your animal, you're you're playing with fire. You're playing with potential disaster. And people have to understand that you need to do the simple things that will keep your dog from becoming a victim like you would your children. I'm really glad you brought that up. Chipping is critical and making sure the information on the chip is up to date. The other thing that we do at Beagle Freedom Project is uh, we put a GPS on every single dog uh, who we get out of the laboratory and goes to a foster home and adoptive home. And that's a special device on the collar that tracks these dogs because they are so ter terrified and have PTSD, obviously, from what they've been through. When they hear noises that they're not used to, they bolt. So they run towards any open door, even windows. They've been known to jump through windows. Um, and so it's criti critical to be able to track them. And that's something, it's not very expensive. It's less than $100 to get that. And there's a little monthly fee for some of them. Some of them don't have a monthly fee for peace of mind to make sure this doesn't happen to your dog or cat. I want to tell you that uh, on our Facebook Live, I have never seen such a response as we're getting here today, and I know it's going to happen in the YouTube and also on the the audio podcast, people are just flooding us with, we give money, we want to give money, we're going to give money. They're, they're had, they had no idea what was happening here. 
which is the one thing I'm glad we're, we're bringing forth. And what I also want to make sure that we let people know is that the Beagle Freedom Project, and what a big part of it is saving the broken dogs because these are animals with emotions, with feelings, and as you said, have, have never been treated properly. So uh, saving them is a huge part of what you do. When you rescue a laboratory animal, you are truly rescuing this animal from a life of horror and pain. You know, a lot of these dogs are very broken when they're released. You can come out, Mama. They're scared of the human touch. We're not anything good in their eyes. All you have to do is look at her, and you can see the fear, the mistrust in people. She could feel safe, and that was the first time I was able to get her out of the crate. The little kids next door take them for a walk. They take them in the wagon. I think I'm pretty lucky, you know. I just, I think that Benny's a pretty special dog. He is the absolute love of my life. She's been such an amazing addition to our family. She has such neat things that she does. She stands up on her hind feet and dances and does circles. She loves going outside and running around uh, and playing with her brothers. And we could not imagine our life without her. <laughs> I love every second of this. Shannon, how do you do it? I mean, you've been doing this a long time. The emotional toll of something like this is incredible when you see these animals when you have to deal with it you've talked about having to go into the hospitals and and see what happens to them i i'm i'm a mush when it comes to animals i don't know if i'd be able to handle it how how have you been able to hold yourself together and be able to stay at this every single day it's definitely a challenge um, it's not easy to do. <laughs> um, there are definitely times where I break down, but I know that I need to be strong for the animals. And I know that there's light at the end of the tunnel because of what we do, because of the support of so many. All people need to do is see that this is going on and they want to help. We have a huge family of over 3,000 adopters, and then we have a whole world of people who help us, who volunteer, who donate, who you know tell us about animals and facilities we can rescue. And um, I know that with proper legislation that we can end this. And I just have to focus on that. And with each and every rescue we do, when I get to meet one of these amazing survivors and let him or her see the sunshine for the first time. That's what I hold on to. I think it's interesting because as we're doing the interview right now, the sun has kind of broken through a little bit where you are. And it's it's kind of, you can see it, it's shining off the camera lens a little bit uh, in, in the whole interview we've done. But you're coming through an almost an angelic glow right now, Shannon. And, and I, I, I tend to think you deserve it for all that you've done and for all that you are going to do. We want to raise money because I know that every dollar helps. We have been flashing throughout the, the live presentation here on Facebook Live. It'll be on YouTube, but it's also going to be part of the audio podcast as well. What can people do? We've, we've got the websites, everything else here, but what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Send some money, be part of your project. Uh, go to our website, BF org stands for Beagle Freedom Project dot org, and I um, have an e-newsletter so that you are aware of everything on it and can get involved. We always need volunteers, and so as you were stating earlier, you know we're global, so we're all over the United States, and we're also in other countries, and we need volunteers to help us do transports, um, to you know help with animals in hospitals with those types of needs. 
Then we also need, of course, always amazing people who are fosters and adopters, and they can fill out those applications online as well. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, of course, we're a nonprofit, and all of this doesn't come cheap. <laughs> and so any donation helps us, and, you know, it's tax deductible to the extent provided by law where you are. Um, but we stretch every dollar. For the amazing work that we do, and I'm not ashamed to brag about what we do because I'm so proud of our work and um, everyone who works at BFP, uh, we're a small team. We're actually a small nonprofit with a very small team, uh, and we do a ton of work, and we all love it. We're all completely dedicated to it, but we couldn't do it without the help of others. So please go on our website, bfp.org donate, sign up to volunteer, sign up to foster, sign up to adopt, um, and get involved. It will be the best thing that you've ever done. I have been attempting to put this interview together for several months. The pandemic got in our way. So many other things did. Um, Lily was nice enough to help us and, and to make sure everything got done. This, I'm, I'm shocked, shocked, if you will, that I got through this interview and didn't lose it because I thought I was going to at least a few times because I'm, I'm so emotional about uh, the animals. So before we go, I, I want to make sure to tell you that I, I was told that I, I had to be sure that I got this done because there's a, a little girl in my life who said, Daddy, you better get this done because otherwise I will bite you for, for, for treats later. That's uh, my little girl, Bailey. Uh, who has been in our life for uh, seven years. And um, that's, I got to tell you, that's a great picture right there, Shannon. That was when we had a hurricane bearing down on us in Florida. And she just crawled up on the back of the couch and she put her paw up to put it on my arm as if to say, everything's okay, Daddy. Um, and that has been, you know, one of those those pictures that we've we've cherished throughout the years. And, you know, the flying nun picture is always one of my favorites. But these are what this is what beagles do when they're just having fun. And not only that, she has a, a 65 pound brother in Magnus the Elk Hound. So isn't isn't it nice for a change to see, you know, the really good pictures uh, from home? I mean, it's I, I'm looking at you right now. It's it's fun to look at, isn't it? To watch to watch people who actually understand what the love of an animal is. It really uh, touches me that you know you have this family at home and you understand they're they're sentient beings. They're members of your family. I mean, look at her. I mean, she just knew what you were feeling. She wanted to calm yeah, you kids. down and say everything's okay. You know. Yeah, that I mean, that's an amazing picture right there. That photo just speaks volumes about dogs in general and the beagle breed. You know, uh, just how sweet, trusting, smart. I mean, they're very intelligent dogs, loving and loyal. She is that as long as I give her her treats and as long as I give her her dinner. Uh, <laughs> 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 Shannon, I, I really hope that we get a chance to touch base again. Uh, my my microphone, my cameras um, are always open to the Beagle Freedom Project and anything that we can ever help do at any time. Uh, I know that this interview is going to live for a long time. We're going to make sure that as many people see it as we possibly can. And I want to I want to congratulate you. I want to congratulate everybody on your team for everything that you've done. Keep fighting the good fight. Stay in there. And when this legislation comes up and you need somebody to get out there and scream for you, you give me a call and I'll be right there anytime. I will. Thank you so much. You are part of this and you're part of the change, just putting this out there. I love it. Thank you so much, Ed. This is amazing. You're educating so many people who wouldn't have otherwise known about this. And this is what it's all about, is educating everybody and creating change that way. So thank you. It has. It has been my pleasure. Shannon, thanks so much. Pet the puppies and thank everybody there for me, will you please? I will do that, Absolutely. definitely. Absolutely, thanks. Shannon Keith and the Beagle Freedom Project. Remember to go ahead and visit that website here. Let me go ahead one more time. And for those who have been looking for the website again, first of all, if you want to send them a note, it's info at bfp.org. 
There is a phone number for the office only, but I do not recommend you use that. Let me recommend that you use the website, as Shannon recommended, HTTPS, all that garbage stuff, if you will, BFP.org. Go there and be part of the effort. They need you. They need the help, and those puppies need the help as well. I want to thank everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here on The Man in the Arena. You'll find out in a couple of moments how to find us on all social media. But on the way out, I want to make sure that we bring you this, which is something a little bit special, because being in Southern California, the Beagle Freedom Project is lucky enough to have certain people help them. This is Maria Menounos and Whitney Cummings, who are part of the effort who will let you know exactly how important this all is. Thanks a lot, everybody. And until we meet again, I'm Ed Berliner. Rock on, true believers. I don't know who said it. Who said that the quality of society can be uh, determined by the way they, people treat their animals. If we can just treat our animals with dignity and respect and love, I think every, everything is going to improve. Just to see them be scared but also just so forgiving. Like, I wasn't afraid to put my hand in the kennel. I wasn't thinking anybody was gonna bite me, but they should bite me, because I'm human, and humans have done such a disservice to them and treated them so poorly, so... But I know I had no fear, and I could just feel their energy. They're just such great creatures. They're going to great homes. They're gonna live the good life, finally. So it's kind of just a mixed emotional bag. Be sure to stay connected on social media with questions, comments, conundrums, you name it. It's at Berliner Speaks on Twitter, Facebook, and on Instagram. A great place to talk business and learn a lot more about what we do is simply check us out on LinkedIn. Just go there and search out Ed Berliner. A reminder that every single episode of The Man in the Arena is uploaded to YouTube. Just go to welcometothearena.com, or if you're on YouTube, search out Ed Berliner Media. If you would prefer to listen to The Man in the Arena, every episode is available for download on all the major audio podcast platforms. The Man in the Arena is produced by Entourage Management, LLC, and Entourage Media.